My name is Afsane Sharif. I'm here with my colleagues, Emily and Jeff, co-facilitators for today. It's really inspiring to see so many dedicated professionals here today, united by our common goals for making our education accessible to all students. Today, we are here not just to celebrate your achievements, your projects. We are here to share ideas and sharing the innovative ways you have transformed teaching and learning. Each team today has a story to tell, a story of challenges, a story of success, and innovation. We've seen remarkable creativity in applying UDL principles, and it's important that we take these ideas insights and projects back to our own practices. I encourage you all to ask questions, to be engaged throughout the, um, today's event, and to think about how these ideas that you see from other people in their own projects can be adopted in your own context. Let's make the most of today's opportunity, not only to gain insights, but also to connect with each other and build on the fantastic work already done. I look forward to the discussion and ideas that will emerge from today's presentation. Thank you, and let's have a great event and help yourself to cookies and coffee. So um, um, based on today's session, we have opening remarks, and then we have part one, um, about seven, eight teams will present. Um, each team will have six minutes, including question and um, answer. So five minutes, four or five minutes presentation, one minute question and answer. And then we have some break time. We listen to you, we um, have more break time and a network opportunity. We will have break time and network opportunity where you can kind of continue your conversation. And then we have uh, accessibility and UDL hearing from our students. We have representative, our colleagues from CFA, AC, Sarah, and AJ um, from Center for Accessibility. And then we have second round of team presentation. We have um, kind of a light lunch and networking opportunity. A quick program post evaluation and project evaluation update, and then we have closing remarks and acknowledgement. So, we'd like to acknowledge that we are gathered today on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of Muskegon people. As we come together today, we are reminded of our shared responsibility to respect and honor the history, culture, and rights of indigenous people. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Elisa Bani Assad, Professor of Teaching, Department of Computer Science, and the Acting Director of Center for Teaching Learning Technology, who will be delivering um, this morning's opening remarks. Elisa, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, and a microphone. I should be doing karaoke with this. <laughs> um, don't get me started. <laughs> um, well, listen, it's lovely to see everybody. Um, I'm really privileged today to be to be joining you here on uh, their traditional Musqueam lands and in joining you here for this incredible uh, session about the UDL and bringing accessibility to campus. I'm, you know, really drawn to reflect on the the true decolonization uh, relevance of accessibility. Um, so, you know, I have a, a lot to say about accessibility, actually. It's something that is incredibly close to my own heart. Um, so as a, as a child, I was, I am neurodiverse and struggled with learning very profoundly. I was an absolute lost cause in my schooling. And, you know, teachers regularly gave me the strong impression that I was annoying in class, that I wasn't keeping up, um, that I wasn't able to do the work. And the, the profound lack of sense of belonging had such a deep impact on my psyche through to today. What I later learned was that I am dyslexic and have ADHD. 
And this is a pretty rockin' combination for doing terribly in school, especially if teachers have not been trained or informed and so have no understanding of how to approach a student like that with any empathy um, beyond seeing a student like that as just a real problem for being able to make class move forward in a reasonable way. Um, I was experiencing this in England in the 1970s, which tells you my age. And England in the 70s was still pretty harsh in terms of education. Corporal punishment was still a thing. So it was a very difficult experience. It was a very colonial experience. And so when I talk about decolonization and accessibility, I'm talking about that. I'm talking about the fact that our education system is so grounded in humiliation and punishment and fear. And programs like this are all about breaking that horrible cycle of fear-based education. Programs like this help give hope that students who are different, who are not able to keep up, and who maybe have been given strong messages in their K-12 education, that they don't belong, that they can't keep up, that they're kind of losers in class, um, that, that they do belong, and that we can teach them, and that they can learn, and that they have vital contributions to make in the world that they are not losers, in fact, that they are really valued members of the learning community. So I feel super, super strongly about this. And I know there's still work to be done because my kids, who I think are brilliant, are dyslexic, autistic, and have ADHD. And I am watching them go through the same sad struggle now in this decade in Canada that I went through in the 1970s in a deeply corporal punishment colonial environment. And that breaks my heart. And so what I want to say is we have a real responsibility here in this room to completely change and be loud about our way of changing the education system in this city, in this province, in this country, in the world. Because we have to stop approaching students as being erroneous if they are not the same as the narrow acceptability band that we were trained for. This has to end. So this is a super encouraging room. I'm looking out at inspiring people who have spent months working hard to break this down and to ruthlessly question the way that we do education so that our next generation of kids can go to school with a sense of existential confidence as opposed to feeling apologetic just walking in the door. And that's really what we're all here for. So accessibility profoundly is our responsibility. We must do this because not just because it's UBC's strategic plan, and not just because it's a ministerial requirement, but because this is a human requirement. People should not be walking into places of learning and feeling like they have to apologize for their own existence. So we're breaking ground here. You are breaking ground here. You're doing vital work. And I am so grateful to you for the work that you're doing. So I just want to say amazing, amazing, amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So I've said all of my slides, which is how I do things. Um, I also want to say thank you to the development team for the same reason. I am so proud of our institution that we are taking this seriously, that we are understanding the responsibility that we have to make profound change in our educational models that we as an institution, that the funding groups, that the Vice Provost Academic Office has decided to dedicate time to this and resources and people. This is not a cheap program. This is an expensive program. And I am proud that we're spending all of these resources, all of this thought, all of this time on really focusing 
on changing the way that we deliver university education. The mandate of the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology is really to help infuse the strategic goals of UBC, but really humanity, into the teaching practice of this university. It is possible that there are great educators like all of you who take it upon yourselves to look at the, the goals of this university and infuse those goals and infuse good practice and infuse basic human decency into your teaching practice. That is, that is possible. That is, you exist, existence proof. But at CTLT, we are mandated with making sure that everyone understands that it is the responsibility of us as educators to elevate our teaching practice in all of these profound ways. Education is our fundamental human need. The first thing that we do when we are alive is we learn to breathe. And we continue learning all the way through. And so your job here is not just to grow your own minds about UDL, and you know that. Your mandate is to go out and change the way that we do education, exactly as I've just said, so that students can walk into classrooms with a sense of belonging and courage and excitement and without apology. And that is what these guys have taken on. You have put a tremendous amount of careful thought into how to infuse into a gifted group of educators this mandate. Thank you. Thank you so much for the work that you've done. So just a reminder to all of you, this is not a closed space. Your job now is to change this university, to go talk about this, and to be ambassadors to your fellow educators and to say there is a way to educate without making students feel bad about who they are. This is now your role. And this program is, you know, technically comes to an end, but your role in it does not come to an end. Anytime you're wondering, how do I continue this mandate? The CTLT is there for you. We are continuing in our mission to make sure that the depths of accessibility are explored at this university forever and in an increasing capacity for years to come. So please stay in touch and stay in touch with each other and stay in touch with me because I'm curious about how things go. So thank you for having me here today. I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much, Elisa. What a wonderful opening remarks. So um, now the order of presentation for today, as you, uh, we discussed and I distri distributed prior to this uh, session, we are going to have the first group um, to present. Uh, about eight people, eight teams are going to uh, present in the first hour, and then we'll have a break. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Um, to kick off part one of our team presentations, we'd like to share with you the work my colleagues and I have been have been doing, where our goal is to apply UDL principles. I forgot I need to speak in my UDL principles um, in Canvas to support nursing students learning in a lab course. Um, lab courses are essential in understanding um, nursing. It's an essential part of the undergraduate nursing curriculum because this is where they learn the habits of the hand, habits of the head, um, needed to navigate the day-to-day -day practices of, um, of a nurse. So Elizabeth isn't here today, but I do have my colleague Melissa and, oh, nope. <laughs> There we go. Um, and uh, Elizabeth and I are from the School of Nursing, and Melissa is the director of the Center for Ex Instructional Support through ABSI. And um, Melissa's been our cheerleader and supporter, so grateful for you and all the help you've um, given us. 
So if you have your phones with you, you're more than welcome to scan the QR code and follow along. Um, if you have your computers with you, if you go into Canvas where we had to post our presentations, it's there as well. You won't have to scroll down because I was the last one to submit something. So it's at the top. Um, uh, this is also an invitation, actually. So I'm using Satori as a, a, a platform to present this information to you. If I did this correctly, it, you should be able to offer comments at the bottom. And so if you notice anything that you're like, hey, Carla, that is not what this is all about, I would love to hear from you. Um, so feel free to offer those um, comments, please, and thank you. So for the past few months, um, we've been working together to redesign the Canvas site for, I know it says Nursing 401, um, it's actually Nursing 402. Nur nursing 402 is the fifth and final uh, lab course students take in the nursing program. It's a one credit course, which equates to 26 hours. And the purpose of the course is to to create a place for students to consolidate all of the psychomotor learning that they've been doing in the program and um, it's placed just before they need to complete 312 hours as part of their final practicum. And then after that, they graduate. And for this project, the course will be offered in 2025. So we've got lots of work to do afterwards. Um, in this slide, um, really just presenting to you the um, are, are deliverable. So what we want to do is to redesign this Canvas site so that we can create an exemplar for our colleagues in the School of Nursing. Um, we want to um, increase accessibility of learning resources, intentionally incorporate UDL principles into the lesson plans, but also into the design of Canvas as well. And last but not least is to share our learnings with our colleagues, not only at the School of Nursing, but perhaps even um, in APSI. Okay. So how have we been incorporating UDL into our project? So with intentional, thinking about this intentional work that we are doing, um, we'd like to share three key proposed changes that align with UDL principles of engagement, representation and action and expression, starting with the homepage. It's a screenshot of our homepage right now. Um, you know, first look, it looks you know, the information's there, but I think we can do a bit better, um, a better job around um, engaging learners. So we want to, first and foremost, foster uh, belonging and community in this course. And it really starts with how we invite learners into the space. And whether that's the physical space or the digital space or online, um, if you're a fan of Priya Parker's um, The Art of Gathering, um, she talks about um, how we invite learners, not just actually when your course begins, but what you do even before the course begins. So in the School of Nursing, we usually will make Canvas course live um, before the beginning of the, before the first day of class. Um, and so we're hoping that by incorporating um, strategies. So I'm not going to go over all of these things um, because of time, um, but we want to change the way that we uh, welcome students by using we and you as opposed to the student will do such and such. Personalizing our communication, we believe, whether in written format or with the use of audiovisual recordings, we hope to optimize the relevance and value of this course in their nursing practice. For me, one key learning from this program was the task of creating and including an accessibility statement. That's such an essential, oh my goodness, one minute left, essential part of building community and fostering a sense of belonging. Um, Drawing on the principle of multiple means of representation, we found many opportunities to include practices that support um, this principle, and it's through the use of intention, intentional use of images, graphics, videos, text. We hope to make the content accessible to learners. And I want to give a shout out to someone who taught me how to activate the immersive reader um, on Canvas. I've done this and will continue to engage learn or encourage learners to use that. Um, learning about the immersive reader function also made us re reflect on how we present information. So as much as I love Satori, it does, it, it does this like 
reading, um, it breaks up information into blocks, and I don't know if um, immersive readers actually read that way. So that's part of the investigation that I still have to do. Um, in terms of designing multiple means of action and representation, we want to maximize the use of pages. So we have learning activities in the course. Um, we want to, we realize that we made plenty of assumptions at the end of time of learners and their capacity to prepare for active learning experiences. And so our work has just really started. Um, and I'm just gonna go to the very last one. It's there for you to have a look. Um, is creating some of the content, um, continuing our knowledge sharing with colleagues. And again, I hope this is not the end of our conversation. Please feel free to use the comment section and um, add comments there too. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Henry from Arts ISIT uh, Educational Technologies. Um, so Jonathan today is in Hong Kong doing our conference. So as uh, he's a partner working so closely with him uh, for the uh, last few months, I'm here today to click the play button for him because he, <laughs> he offered me a really good uh, video. And after the video, I think I will have uh, one minute uh, to answer the questions. Okay, here we go. Hello everyone, so I'm here to share our update on our UDL project uh, so far. So if you remember, our project was on applied econometrics and we had these uh, four goals. So the first one was to develop ways to create accessible written content, um, which helps us teach econometrics, which can be integrated with Canvas. Uh, the second goal was to use audio tools like screen readers or text to speech to help students, especially in situations with complex notation and terminology. The third one was to help use those same screen readers and other kinds of assistive technologies to work with econometrics tools like Jupyter or other kinds of computational statistical environments. And the final one was to help develop flexible methods for skills or mastery based learning of our learning objectives in this course. So how things gone? Well, for the first objective, we're actually pretty close to being done this one. Um, so we identified a number of uh, different tools and a workflow using some tools like Quarto and Pandoc, which create accessible written mathematical and computational text uh, in several different formats. They're reflowable in the lingo of uh, UDL. We also identified a number of different Canvas integration options, um, which we're currently in the process of exploring. Um, in, in fact, I'm using it right now. What you're seeing on the screen right now is actually the technology that we're using for all of the materials, so all, the, all the math and the code and the um, this is actually comp computed data. Um, all of this stuff is rendered by our framework and it's all machine readable. It works with text to speech, uh, things like that. And also what's really nice is it renders into different formats, like for example, this presentation, um, or PDFs, or as I'll point out in a second, it also renders into computational notebooks as well. So um, it's surprisingly useful. Um, we have a few things still to do. So the first one is we really need to uh, test the Canvas integration. There's a number of different options for how to do it. So we need to explore that. Because a lot of this is rendered using um, HTML or a kind of web page, um, we need to test and proof a lot of the accessibility options like alt text or things like that in the rendered output. That's something that's hard to do without actually generating everything and then kind of going through it. So that's still to be done. We also need to examine its performance with different kinds of browsers. As you probably know, different web pages can look different in different kinds of browsers. So we need to check with a whole bunch of different ones. And so we're going to be enlisting our students to help a little bit with this. Our second goal, which was about audio tools, um, especially in situations with complex notation, um, we got pretty far on this as well. So we were able to identify um, sort of the optimal settings for different screen readers. In fact, we identified a best screen reader and a configuration to work with the system we just outlined, and we were able to test that configuration in a number of different situations. So that basically is done. Um, we also developed a retrieval augmented generative large language model to help parse LaTeX code. Um, it sounds more complicated than it is. Um, and we're probably going to just hold on onto this one because this is the subject of some work that's coming up in a large uh, teaching and learning uh, enhancement fund project um, in the next year or so. So probably put a hold on that one, but we did explore a little bit of those options. One of the cool things is goal three, which was to enable screen readers to work with technologies like uh, Jupyter or other kinds of computational econometrics. 
basically became irrelevant. Um, when we combined goal one and goal two, one of those reflowable formats was computational frameworks. So we can basically produce readable or integrated uh, tools like Jupyter that can help students use screen readers to work with code and things like that. So this ended up being um, kind of irrelevant or superseded by our other two goals. The final goal, which was to develop uh, flexible methods for skills or mastery based assessment of our learning objectives is still TBD. Um, it's gonna be our focus for the fall sort of pedagogical practice and identification. We really need to test some of these tools that we're using and then see how um, there can, they can be kind of integrated into the course. And then from there, we can start to identify, you know, mastery based learning and how it can interact with some of the other decisions we've made. Um, we really also need to do some curriculum mapping of this course. And this is all stuff that we're, we're still working on. So that's it for my update. Um, if you look behind me, I'm currently in Hong Kong, which is why I can't be here today. Um, but I'm sure Henry or Chris will be able to take over and fill you in on any other things that I have overlooked and answer any questions. So thank you very much. So as I work so closely with Jonathan, I hope I can answer any question if you have. I know like uh, Jonathan in the video mentioned some like uh, technical words like reg argument LLM or the latex. Oh, one minute remaining. Okay. <laughs> if you feel any um, interesting, like knowing of these uh, technologies or tools we are using, in our UDL program, feel free to talk to me after this. Thank you. Hello. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Laura sends, Dr. Laura Ishiguro sends her apologies. Uh, she cannot make it today. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Jung. Um, I'm an uh, educational technologist uh, with Arts ISIT. And uh, basically, uh, I'll just get into it. So, um, Laura uh, is the associate professor in history, and uh, she has a uh, course history 329, which uh, deals with uh, the history of uh, underrepresented people. So that kind of serves a challenge in uh, uh, textbooks as uh, she's kind of created her own textbook. So uh, uh, her course, she has actually been uh, readily uh, pursuing uh, UDL principles. Um, but she needs to do a full course redesign, um, in particular, uh, to better reflect uh, current teaching practices, more responsive uh, to current students and student concerns, and updated uh, materials and subjects. Um, and she is looking to uh, infuse UDL three up throughout, which the challenge is in that is that uh, when she gives a lecture, she records it, she transcribes it, um, and uh, she has to uh, correct for language because, you know, the AI stuff, uh, you know, some, if someone's name is spelt with Eric, E-R-I-K, it's not going to get that. So Dr. Eric something, uh, it's all messed up. So she has to go through the transcripts. Uh, she, uh, accessibility also means that she wants to be accessible to the students and to uh, keep engagement. So that also means she has, uh, uh, like, uh, she keeps... Uh, communication open through forums. So basically she's up until like one or 2 a.m. Uh, basically like creating uh, all of this content. So she needs to streamline that and modulate it in some way. And so that's kind of what we're working on um, right now. So we're trying to scaffold the uh, course and I'll get into it in a bit. So, um, so we're, uh, the current syllabus te template is strong and does well to reflect uh, Laura's approach to teaching specific courses, but uh, it's it's kind of it's too long, right? And uh, the existing template is fairly aligned to um, UDL, um, and uh, she, there's significant inspiration from uh, Cook's Dear Elia. Uh, I'm not super familiar with that. That's <laughs> that's <wrong. laughs> um, so uh, we are in progress. So, uh, so Laura has shifted to a photograph-based primary source um, project uh, to hacking a Canadian history textbook. So this is what I was talking about, uh, underserved um, populations. And so basically one of the things that we have to do, a lot of these uh, textbooks and histories, uh, they're like handwritten, uh, they're grainy, they're yellowed, uh, poor contrast, in cursive. So not really accessible to a lot of students uh, who need to read this stuff or understand it. So uh, we've actually used um, some AI, uh, something called Transcribus, uh, to read 
uh, all of that cursive and uh, transcribe it into uh, typed text that can then be read with screen readers and such like that. But also, you know, once again, it's not perfect. People make spelling mistakes, so you still have to go through all that and edit it. Um, so also, uh, yeah, videos. So another big thing that um, we've been doing is, once again, uh, if you're giving like a two-hour lecture, editing that takes a long time, transcribing that takes a long time, so we're finding um, areas um, in Laura's uh, lectures that are reproducible, like introductions, you know, uh, teaching people about research, you know, all kind of like the uh, nut and bolts type things uh, in a history class, uh, recording that at UBC Studios, uh, editing it, making it sound really good, making it look really good, creating those transcripts uh, that can then be readily, um, you know, recycled class over class over class. And then that also gives Laura the space to, you know, uh, you know, give her lectures and like freestyle it and freewheel it and not have to edit two hours, but maybe edit like half an hour, like all the just the unique stuff that's in uh, her courses. And so, uh, yeah, so representation is important. Um, and another uh, thing with the uh, videos is also to be able to include a whole bunch of material while talking that maybe um, if you're not super prepared, you could just like throw in. So that's great. And uh, making assigned materials more accessible. Uh, Laura is working on creating like asynchronous, asynchronous model, modules um, and resources. So that includes um, like H5P interactive books, um, once the, uh, the archival research that we talked about, uh, the, uh, right now, like, you know, UBC Archives actually has a lot of transcripted, um, they've, trans they've uh, translated a lot of stuff into transcripts. So that's actually great. That helps um, work a lot. Um, so the status, it's in progress. Um, there's some drafted material and like there's a lot of work still to do uh where we've pretty much just like scratched the surface of a lot of it we've only had like time to make a few videos and test the transcription a bit so uh yeah um so primary source analysis and best better practices so uh less of a standalone part of redesign project um right now so the primary source engagement is less open-ended and more specific with the possibility for transcription and or description um, for individual sources, but ongoing and thinking to develop better general principles. And that's it. And I have like less than a minute. Thank you, everyone. Um, so Dr. Laurie Ford sends her regards and regrets cannot be here today, um, but I would really like to uh, also introduce the rest of the UDL team that we have. So we have Dr. Koichi Hasiyama, um, Abby, Abby Del Masio, and um, Emma um, Nejad. Right, great, awesome, um, who've been working on what I think was originally ECD 407, it is now ECD 406, which is a, a fully online course um, for the Early Childhood Education Basic Certificate Program on um, Curriculum Development, right? Awesome. Cool. Um, a really brief land acknowledgement. I know that we've already done one, but a lot of the work for this has taken place on uh, the, the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil -Waututh people, and we want to respect and acknowledge that today. So I'm going to pass over to my colleagues. Um, this project has been a really awesome experience for us to review um, our course materials and our practices. And in that, we've sort of learned and unlearned quite a few things. So I'm going to pass over to that. Yes, thank you, Gabby. So the very first one that we kind of wanted to pinpoint is the importance of flexibility. So what we've all kind of learned throughout the UDL course is how there are accessible needs for students and individuals that are both visible and invisible. And so the crux of being able to accommodate and assist these students really comes with the development of the course itself and really starting from the skeleton. And rather than students approaching the course and facing these barriers, really making sure that instructors, course developers are uh, addressing these needs and providing as much accessibility for these students as possible. And with that, it also talks about how instructors and course developers need to also question themselves, their biases, the way that they think and be mindful of how can we provide the utmost flexibility for these students who need it, may not be comfortable sharing the things that they are going through and ensuring that the course is available and um, 
accessible again for all students. Thank you. And uh, next point uh, was the importance of language to build connection with the participants. And we tried our best. We added a, an accessibility statement to the beginning of the syllabus. And we tried our best to make the syllabus uh, inviting, especially because it's an online one, uh, to build this connection with the students so that they will feel comfortable connecting with the instructor. And, um, and asking them the same. It's um, it, to be respectful of everyone. And uh, yes, thank you. Hi, um, this is much, I think it's more about my personal findings due to this, uh, based on this uh, UDL project. But um, well, I, I'm in education. So uh, my usual I mean, teaching goal is uh, not for students to find answers to the specific questions, but rather I want students to find their own questions to pursue. And then I got my new questions through this project, which is also something for me. Um, so normally in teaching practice, I often um, do this assessment as learning, like welcoming students to uh, co-construct the grading rubrics together with me or well, multimodality in teaching, I often, um, for example, like uh, encourage students to do a dialogic submission of a research paper, etc. cetera. Um, but um, my kind of attention went into the university language, the university policies, how can we own and challenge our university policy in the languages we often are required to put in our syllabi, because University is ours, not by, I mean, not of the uh, managers. So uh, this is something I wanted to put in our daily practice of teaching. So that's sort of what we've learned. Um, so this is what we've already done. Um, so as uh, both Abby, um, Emma, and um, and Koichi to, as well uh, spoke to, uh, we've done a really big syllabus overhaul. Um, so this is including an accessibility statement, um, more personalized language. Um, so using a lot of I, we, you, um, rather than generalized sort of passive language um, and also actionable instructions linked to professional practices. So for example, we had had a section on the importance of using people names correctly, um, but there wasn't really any action. So we've changed it to, you know, we want to respect that everyone is coming from different places. Um, I'm going to make an effort as an instructor to learn how to pronounce your name properly. And my expectation is that you do that too. That's what we in ACE want you to be doing in the field. So please, that's going to be our practice. So those kinds of things have changed in our syllabus significantly. We're also doing an accessibility sort of check on our developing course. So in from a web accessibility point of view, we're really going through everything and making sure that it sort of cuts, cuts the mustard, but also adding in other more accessible pieces. So interactive objects with H5P, um, other options for in engaging with the material by you know adding in padlets and other sort of um, interactive objects. Um, and then the other thing too is that we've developed an opening survey and questionnaire, which is going to sort of do two things. The first thing is to sort of get an idea of who our students are, but also to add in a few couple a couple of questions to make sure that they've read the syllabus because we've done a lot of work on the syllabus. We want to make sure that it is functioning as intended. What we're planning to do after we release the course, and it's releasing in September, so we have a lot of work to do to get ready for the upcoming term, um, is that we're hoping to do a program-wide survey. We want to get an idea of, uh, a better idea of who our students are, what we're doing right, what we're not doing so well, what we can improve. Um, we're also going to be having some teaching and learning sessions with our ECA instructors. Um, so at the moment, we're focusing on this one course, but we're hoping to then roll this out to the program at large. Um, and then once we have run this course and we've gotten some feedback from students um, reviewing what we've done, and then hopefully having a wider application of this template um, that we can apply to our other courses in the program. Feedback, suggestions, ideas, thoughts, questions. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so hi, everyone, my name's Nolan. Uh, I don't have a staff um, partner for this project. We're the smallest faculty on campus, forestry. So we've got a fairly small um, uh, staff roster and they're very busy right now, but I do wanna point out that the course I'm talking about, um, which we call the Conservation Field School, uh, is not just myself, I coordinate it and I instruct in it, but I've also got um, co-instructors. Uh, three co-instructors who are involved too. Um, so I've been keeping them updated and they're kind of part of this process as well, um, coming along this, this journey for UDL with me. So I think it's important just as a, 
to kind of preview and give some context um, for some of the changes that we've been integrating uh, to just highlight uh, this is a very unique course. And so it's a different format um, for most of the rest of the ones that we're hearing today. Uh, it's 15 credits. It's a capstone course. So it's kind of the last thing that these students take or nearly the last thing uh, within their degrees. And it's the only thing they take during the fall semester uh, in their fourth year or for some students their fifth year. And so it includes lectures, it includes computer labs, but then also a very uh, significant component are field trips, um, including three week long field trips, uh, as well as um, day trips. So these were things that we were thinking about that I was thinking about especially, but also my co-instructors um, about integrating UDL, not just in a classroom uh, setting, but also within the field. And so I'm gonna give you just a very brief kind of scattering, a sampling really of a few changes that, that um, we're gonna be integrating or that we've already kind of started to integrate, but we might be expanding on. Um, something that I noticed when I was going through this process of thinking about UDL was that at least in the context of this course, it didn't operate so much on kind of a big broad scale like course objectives, but more specific kind of pointed um, uh, smaller things, but many of them. Um, so I'm just gonna go through a few, but there's lots of things that we've uh, been thinking about. Start out with um, multiple means of engagement. And one of the kind of sub-objectives within this, heightening salience of goals. Um, we have a course manual for the field school. And if you look at the page number you can see there for the course manual, uh, it's big. It's like a textbook. It's 238 pages. Uh, and it contains a lot of, almost all the information is important. It contains guidelines for all the assignments, um, schedules, uh, so very important things for the students to know. But then there was a lot of other information, um, things like how to conduct statistical analyses or how to uh, you know, write a scientific report. Um, I'd had comments uh, through some focal group interviews that I've had students do uh, this past year for another project um, within this course, um, as well as just conversations with the students. So they find this very imposing and they don't get through this giant manual. So I wanted to work on bringing out some of the pieces um, making them a bit more accessible by kind of integrating them in other components of the course. So especially situations in which I'm there or there's other instructors or teaching assistants there with the students uh, with them. So not just reading this big package manual um, on their own in the evenings, because I know they're not doing that. Um, so one example, pulling out statistical analyses, the information on how to run them, how to conduct them, why do we need them, um, putting it right into scripts for R. And then I'm in there in the computer lab with them and I'll talk, I'll work with them through these scripts. Um, keep them a little bit more focused on it. Another one, very demands uh, and resources to optimize challenge. So typically we're probably thinking about challenge um, in terms of mental uh, aspects, but there can be physical aspects, certainly, especially with the field school. Um, so we take them up to the top of a mountain and we do really long hikes. In the past, we've done a uh, loop hike. So starting out uh, at kind of your, your starting point and then doing a really big loop, which is great but we like to always have one instructor or TA at the front and one instructor or TA at the back and then some in the middle. Um, and if you run into a situation where some students are struggling to get through this you know, 800 meter elevation gain, 15 kilometer hike, uh, then you can have issues with really big spread and students at the back feeling like they need to continue um, because otherwise it causes kind of loss of connection amongst the group. Um, so we're switching that, we're doing a there and back hike uh, just in so a return hike going one direction and then coming back the same way um, for our first big hike of the year. And this is going to allow us to have students who go just part way and then we can just hang out and wait, maybe have lunch and wait for the rest of the group to come back. Uh, multiple means of representation. So this was something that actually we started as a few of these things uh, last year. Um, but as I've been thinking about UDL and I've been realizing these are things that, hey, they should go in the direction we wanna go and we'll start expanding them. Um, so oral field exams, we have a few of them. And uh, something that we're doing now is providing written copies of the questions. So we're not just giving the students the questions orally, but they can also read them, uh, which we've kind of discovered is very important for some students. They're dealing with stress, they're dealing with pressure, they're trying to listen to the question. It's hard for them to focus. Having this written um, copy is, is gonna assist them uh, based on their feedback. And so we're gonna to continue to kind of push that through each of the oral exams, because we've got multiple field trips with multiple exams. Um, representing a diversity of perspectives and uh, identities in authentic ways. I won't go into too many details, but we're expanding our guest speakers. Um, so we've got guest speakers from uh, a broader diversity 
uh, different groups and perspectives, and also tours at areas that we go to. Multiple media for communication. So a field media journal. This is something that we started last year. Um, so it was an assignment in which the students during one of their field trips um, were tasked with creating a media journal, but they could use whatever kind of uh, form creative outlet that they felt was suitable for them. So painting, um, you know, some of them did little botanical drawings. Some of them wrote songs. Um, so we've been thinking about potentially, it's not something we've done yet, but integrating this more um, perhaps throughout other assignments, using that as a bit of a blueprint. Um, another one, building fluencies with graduated levels of support. So we've upped the amount of iterative assignments that are gonna be coming up this fall. So for example, when they're writing a big final scientific report, we've previously had them uh, discuss their methods first and get feedback on that, discuss the results. We're, we're going another step further and we're bringing in the introduction section, have them write a draft of that and they'll get feedback on each one sequentially. Um, and that way that's gonna kind of lead to hopefully a final report in which they've really thought about and been given guidance on each of those sections. Last one is I'm out of time, financial accessibility. So this doesn't fall within those kind of traditional three broad categories of UDL, but really important for this field school. Um, I found just through surveying the students that co the course fee, which is an additional fee, like a lab fee that's attached to this course is a huge uh, concern for students. And all the more so I think in the past couple of years um, as their costs of living have really risen. So we've been working really, really hard to find ways to cut down costs to bring down that course fee. We've managed to drop it um, by 300 bucks per student for this year. And we're gonna kind of continue to find ways in the coming years to reduce it as well. Okay, I'll leave it at that, thank you. Hi everyone. Um, so my name is Janelle. I'm the staff member for this project and Killeen is the uh, faculty member. She's joining us online. Hi Killeen. Um, so Killeen and I both work for the Master of Food and Resource Economics in the Land and Food Systems faculty. Um, but our project focused on the Food and Resource Economics undergraduate program. Um, so I have a question for you. Have you ever been invited to a conference, a birthday party, a wedding, or some sort of event where you receive an invitation and you go to the actual event and it's ex you kind of get a feel for the event based on the invitation that you receive? It's nice to... Um, it's nice to get that, right? So this is an example of a, a conference food pro by BC Food and Beverage. Um, on the left side is the invitation and on the right side is the actual event. You can kind of see the flow and, and the, the invite kind of manages your expectation of what the event is gonna look like. It's nice, it kind of has the same dramatic sort of black and the pink lights and stuff like that. Or on the other hand, maybe you've looked at some travel brochures, all trails, you know, you expect to go on this hike serene, quiet, peaceful, you're gonna be one with nature, and you end up going there, and there's so many people that you're like, you can't find quiet time to yourself. So again, it's, it's sort of a managing expectations kind of thing, is what you, see, what you think you're gonna get versus what you actually get um, when you're in the experience. So we liken it to the academic experience. Uh, we liken it to when, when students are thinking about registering or enrolling for a specific program, a specific degree, or even a specific course. What are those things that they consume? What are the material and communication materials they consume to help with their decision making? Um, and so our project um, thinks about this question. So how can we increase accessibility through our initial course and program materials so learners know what to expect before they even decide to join? And what we're doing is focused on four things. So we're working with the undergraduate um, program of food and resource economics. It's a relatively small faculty. We have about 10 um, instructors. Um, the first thing that we're going to do is to hold a faculty workshop to share UDL principles and examples of things that they can incorporate in their classes to increase accessibility in their classes. So we'll do this likely in September. Um, the second thing that we're doing on the bottom right is to design info posters to visualize information about the Bachelor of Science, Food and Resource Economics degree. So this is the undergraduate program. Um, we recently launched two new majors, um, and this is gonna be targeting high school students, first year students who want to decide, do they want to um, apply for this degree? Do they wanna transfer to this degree? Um, and so providing information that can help them make better decisions, we feel is gonna, is gonna kind of make that 
decision making smoother um, and they can know what to expect before they even you know make the decision. Um, the third thing that we're going to do is to develop an inclusive syllabus template and share that with the faculty members. So the 10 uh, faculty members and eventually potentially to the LFS faculty as well. So the inclusive um, syllabus template is in progress. I'll talk about that later. Um, and along with the template is I'm going to work with five of those 10 instructors um, this fall to revise their course syllabi, to adapt it to the inclusive syllabus template, but also to give them a chance to incorporate some UDL practices to their course, um, little things that they can change for term one. One of the courses happens in term one and four of them happen in term two. So they do have time to make changes to little things, whether it's increasing flexibility or options in assessments um, and things like that. So where are we at? So this is um, for the info posters for the undergraduate degree. On the left side, you can see this is what the web page looks like. So this is what's publicly available now. Um, it kind of uh, contains um, traditional, I would say, traditional information where there's a lot of text. It's in paragraph form. There's some pictures, but it's mostly text-based. And what we want to do uh, with this project is supplement that with info posters. Um, we don't have a lot of data because it's new, so we can't make infographics yet, but info posters that kind of do, for in this example on the right, it's like a roadmap of what does the degree look like? Um, another thing that we'll do is just kind of do a similar sort of poster to explain like how is like what is this BSFE degree, what is data analytics, what is business and markets, those are the two new majors, and maybe help the students to differentiate it for themselves, how it differentiates, how it differs from a, a commerce degree, an economics degree, a data science degree, those kinds of things. Um, for the inclusive syllabus redesign, so these are the uh, images and names and course numbers of the instructors that are going to be part of the five courses that were that I'm going to be working with to redesign um, their syllabus um, and where it's at right now. So this is kind of the template that I started and I'm working with and I'm very grateful to Afsane, to Judy and to Suna for helping me um, provide comments. Like the things, it's annotated, it has their comments, it's a work in progress. Uh, but what it looks like is the inclusive syllabus is on the right side. Um, it, it has some annotations and comments for instructors to be like, okay, what does inclusive syllabus mean? What are we looking for? Um, it's formatted in a way that's accessible to screen readers. It talks about plain language. It talks about inclusive language. It talks about making implicit assumptions explicit. Um, and in addition to just the template itself, on the left-hand side, um, I kind of preempt the syllabus template with a two-pager summary of what is UDL, what are the three pillars of UDL, and what are some examples that they can apply to their courses. Most of the courses are third, fourth year courses, and they're all, because they're all in food and resource economics, it's kind of um, targeted in a way that the examples that they can apply um, helps with social sciences. All right, thank you. Hi, good morning. Oh, I have to set the timer on my on my watch because I know that the invisible person over there will be waving it at me. But OK, um, so I am a teacher in the Master of Occupational Therapy program. And so to give you a bit of context, the program is a cohort based program. Everyone takes the same courses and placements and they move through together. Um, and this specific course, we decided to blow up and start again, um, sort of. Uh, so this was a complete redesign of the course, and we're still in process because, of course, I bit off a very large chunk, and I still am working on doing it. Um, but I uh, decided for today uh, to go through the alphabet um, and tell you different things that we've done for this course uh, based on a through G. Uh, that's as far as I've made it so far. Um, but first, I'll give you a quick overview of the course. So the course um, is meant to give the students some of the kind of basic medical background information that they're going to find useful when they're out on their placements. 
So previously, I have found it to be a bit pathologizing um, and kind of their medical model. So that was, I was like, why did they give me this course on the critical disability studies person? Um, and now maybe I know why. Um, and so that's a, a little bit of sort of the purpose behind the course. So A, uh, is it for alignment, there could have been a lot of things, but better alignment of the content uh, as well as the assignments with the learning objectives of the course. Couldn't change the learning objectives, but I was finding some of the content as well as the assignments were no longer in line with the course itself, the learning objectives. So helping to increase motivation for students um, by making that better alignment as well as cross-curriculum alignment. So these folks are here because they want to be occupational therapists, um, not because they want to learn about all this biomedical information. Um, so it's been important, I think, for us to make sure we're making clear how does this course align with their skills-based courses and their placements um, and across the curriculum uh, to help with that motivation piece? Bs for belonging, because that's, that's my stick. I see it everywhere. Um, but part of belonging in this course is some of us come into this as educators and learners who might live with some of these health conditions we're teaching about in the course. Um, and if we just talk about it from a pathologized perspective, we don't feel a sense of belonging. Um, and we also, in the program as a whole, really work hard on creating community. And so we're integrating some of those pieces also in this course, which is largely online. C is for consistency. So we have in our program, just we're in this course and one other course, launching a, a, an inclusive syllabus as well as Canvas template. template. So we have new templates that are more accessible. So we're launching that this fall uh, in this course as well as another one. And uh, this course, the overall picture of it is that I've now added in at the beginning, we have some in-person classes where we're giving students a critical disability studies and occupational science lens through which to perceive the kind of uh, medical information they're going to be learning in asynchronous online um, Canvas-based classes. So for those classes, we also have templates. Um, so really trying to integrate as a lot of consistency. Uh, D is for delight, uh, because that humanizes us. And so incorporating little moments of delightful things. Um, so I did this last year already. So one of the things I do is every time I send a Canvas announcement, I include a recipe at the end. Um, and I was like, this is, I think this is fun. I don't know if the students care. Um, but I did, I was chatting with one of the students and she was like, oh, I really liked how you always included that. That was, that was delightful. So I thought, okay, well, keep incorporating delight. E is for expertise and experience. So uh, we incorporate different kinds of expertise, acknowledging the students bring expertise. Um, we have our clinical uh, faculty members who are um, working with me to uh, create the asynchronous classes. Uh, and then we have um, patient educators or experiential experts. So we will have four classes um, in person with those folks. My timer is going off on my wrist right now. It tickles. Flexibility is F. Um, so I can tell you more about that. And G is for gratitude. And I'm not even going to tell you about that because my timer is going off. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, but yeah, that's about it. Thanks very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I'm joined by my colleague, Leon. Um, I feel the extra pressure today because we're the last group before the break, so we'll make sure we finish on time. But when we were presented with the, with the title, uh, UDL and Accessibility in Action, the first thing that came to my mind was um, acquiring this superpower over the past three months and now having the opportunity to really putting it into action and doing good. So that's what came to mind. And so we had the little comic here to kind of highlight that. Uh, just a bit of a background. So we're from pharmacy. 
And uh, we've been working on uh, updates through the UDL perspective and lens for two courses. The first one is Pharmacy 471, which is our experiential course. It's eight weeks, 12 credit course. And this is a practicum course that students complete um, at a pharmacy in the community. The second course is a course that we just launched uh, for the first time and it just ended yesterday. And it is a second year elective on exploring rural pharmacy practice. Uh, in terms of the uh, updates, we were planning to, so for Pharmacy 471, we're currently working on updates to our Canvas course. And for Pharmacy 300F, uh, we have um, shared a evaluation survey with students and the survey ends on the 19th. So we're hoping that the information that we get will inform us on changes to the uh, future course uh, uh, to students. So in terms of our course challenges and considerations, there were a few things that came to mind as uh, Leon and I were thinking about, you know, where we can really uh, make some changes and rethink what we're currently doing. The first is around student engagement. Uh, because the practicum course happens outside of UBC, uh, the only time that we actually have uh, opportunity to engage with the students is through an orientation to highlight what the course is about, uh, what the expectations are, and what students are expected to complete during those eight weeks. And unfortunately, because of the timing, the orientation happens usually about eight months or even a little bit longer before the students actually go on site. So there's a bit lag in terms of the uh, engagement that we have with students. And as part of that, uh, I think it limits our ability to really build that community and connection with students, uh, as well as the connection that students have with each other, just because they're going to different places, their rotation schedule may be different, and also the timing of when that happens may vary as well. Uh, in terms of the Canvas site, where most of the information is housed, just because there's a lot of information around uh, course policies, uh, practicum activities, and everything in between, um, it's all being housed right now on, on Canvas. So the design is quite quite linear. Uh, in, in reviewing the information, a lot of times it can be overwhelming from the student perspective, and there might be distractions that limit their ability to really absorb the materials for its intended purpose and to really uh, be able to use this information to help them when while they're on practicum uh, around also text-heavy content and also perhaps the navigation might be difficult as well. And something that we were thinking about but didn't really get to really focus on too much uh, at this point is rethinking the the activities and how we can we should be able to allow students how to have more options to demonstrate their knowledge when when completing these activities uh, I'm gonna pass the mic to Leon to talk about some of the ideas and approaches and how we think we can do things a little bit differently thanks Paulo so um that was the first impression I got when I first saw the site. There was a lot of content in lengthy documents uh, with, with a lot of pages. So one of our big focuses this summer was to present these documents in a way where we provided context, descriptions. We told students how to find certain things and highlights within these documents. Uh, we tried to clarify and simplify information wherever possible. Uh, often this meant breaking up uh, documents and documents into pages and providing that sort of context. We experimented with media. Uh, Paulo is a very personal guy. So we got him in front of a camera, put him uh, in some videos. Uh, we also used some H5P content to create some interactive graphics and roadmaps for students to click through. Uh, and we also tried to emphasize intuition. So what I mean by that is the first time a student sees a video, in the class, they get a little tooltip banner that tells them how to use the platform, how to use the video uh, features that we're providing, transcripts, uh, speed, things like that. And uh, Paulo and I meet every week, and I give him this excuse all the time. Uh, this UDL work takes time and effort, and we're, we're still doing ongoing things. We also want to keep scalability in mind because these uh, this practicum course is part of a series of practicum courses so we want to figure out a way to be consistent uh, create a theme create uh, certain page layouts and templates so that we can apply this uh, in the future more effectively and efficiently 
Thanks, Leon. Uh, in terms of implementations, I'm just going to highlight a few things because I just saw the one minute warning. Uh, so again, Leon mentioned the integration of video, uh, creating that welcome message right at the beginning to make it prominent that, you know, there's actually a person behind this course. And usually it's a team. So trying to personalize things, uh, adding accessibility statement, which I think is something that uh, we feel uh, as a group is really important. Um, um, also uh, highlighting some of that frequently asked questions because um, we get data from and surveys from the students. So it was really important to maybe make those uh, FAQs more um, available to students around important policies such as bereavement, which unfortunately comes up. But at that time, it might be very stressful to students. So really highlighting some of these questions ahead of time might be important for the student, uh, creating checklists and ways to help students stay on track and integrating media as well as um, resources. Ah, my time is up. I apologize for going. But I wanted to thank uh, Jocelyn and also Tasha for helping us with a, uh, a survey that we've deployed. And also, uh, we've been sharing the information with our colleagues through our uh, uh, yearly academic retreat. Thank you very much for listening. Welcome back. We have our colleagues from Center for Accessibility, our partners with this program, and we are excited to have them here, Sarah, AJ, and AC. I'll pass it on to them to talk about updates about accessibility, student involvement in the program, and the wonderful work they are doing. Well, I'm going to shout back the wonderful work all of you are doing and pass the mic pretty quickly. Thank you so much for the opening remarks. I'll have to say someone passed me this article in the walrus uh, that was written, came out this week, and I'm purposely not going to forward it. It knocked the wind out of me, basically saying, UDL is too much work. We have too much work on our plates. Snowflake students, blah, blah, blah. Thank you for having me today because my wind is ignite, reignited. Uh, so thank you. And I'll pass it on to uh, AC, who's going to talk a bit about the student engagement, uh, and AJ. Thank you. All right. Everyone can hear me okay? Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, to echo Sarah, thank you all for all the hard work you have been clearly putting in. This uh, has been amazing to see, to watch, to assist with. Um, I do want to put in a little plug. If people do have questions that are continuing to crop up about accessibility, we can always check in. Um, I think folks have kind of transitioned away from the canvas to some extent, but, you know, um, we do have the opportunity to reach out to me via email if you like. We have um, accessibility workshops that are available to um, kind of check out and register through the CTLT events site that'll be ongoing through the fall. So chances to connect via Zoom or in person, learn more about different techniques and share some of the amazing work that you're doing with other folks, hopefully um, help spark conversations um, and other courses that can really benefit from all the work you've done. Um, so speaking on that point, um, we know because you're here that you are really trying to improve the experiences your students have in your classrooms and thank you for that. Um, I also know from experience and you probably feel this too, it can be tough to know how students are immediately receiving some of the changes that you've made, the work that you've done. You want to check in with them, make sure that they're enjoying it. Sometimes you don't necessarily get that feedback until the end of the first course you've run with these modifications made. Um, but I do just want to remind folks, um, especially now as teams are getting closer to launch, that we do have our amazing team of UDL student facilitators who are here and able to help you um, solve problems, evaluate your content, get a read on how students will be interacting with that content. Um, I know it can be challenging to figure out good ways of getting feedback from students. Um, Natasha is really good at the process of kind of working on that evaluation, getting that content from students, but we can also sort of have our team of facilitators work with you. Um, some of the groups we'll be hearing from have already started that process, and I think it's going pretty well. Um, but especially since some of these standard ways we gather that information, like course surveys, are kind of um, struggling at times to capture some of that information. Maybe students don't feel comfortable directly disclosing to their instructors all of the time the status of their disability or what they need in terms of accessibility. Um, working with our student team can really help get around some of those difficulties. Um, we have a team of four currently. They unfortunately can't be here because they are doing all kinds of fun summer things in advance of the start of term. Um, I'm a little bit jealous of some of their travel plans, 
but um, I am here today to report a little bit on what they've been doing and to remind folks that they are a great resource. They draw upon their own personal lived experiences, the experiences of their friends, their UBC peers, and they're really able to kind of help you identify maybe little friction points in your coursework or things that haven't quite been thought through yet, or maybe just help you address questions as you're going forward thinking about how exactly you want to implement some of these ideas that you're having. Um, they've already been working um, with us. You might remember from some of the UBC Studio events, from our kickoff events, some folks have joined. Um, they've also been working with us to revise and improve some of that content you worked through in those first eight weeks of the course. They assisted us with those uh, asynchronous workshop modules through Articulate, helping us make sure that they were really meeting accessibility needs, you know, bringing in some of that student experience. Um, they're also going to be um, sharing some of their experiences to come on the UDL Hub, and they're currently working with some of our cohort teams. I know um, two folks, both from um, health and from uh, student, um, sorry, active learning activities uh, projects will be presenting shortly, and they're currently doing some review for that content for those teams. Um, when you feel like you're ready to maybe engage with the team, uh, feel free to reach out. I can help you get in touch with our team. Typically, they will be working asynchronously, but uh, the option to kind of meet via Zoom and review your content is also possible. So feel free to get in touch if you haven't yet. Um, I think they've been enjoying the experience. I know I have. And uh, thank you all so much for all the work that you've been doing. I'm just going to switch the slide, I think. Um, so for anyone who is trouble seeing that, I've got a thank you in uh, sign language. And this is a thank you to everyone for, the, again, the work you've been doing. It's a big piece about this as being just a ripple of change. I know that um, currently learning, learning workday that sometimes, you know, when you were engaging with new systems and new things that it can be really helpful to have someone sit beside you and actually take the time to go through it with you and just recognizing that that's the role that many of you can play as you continue to be a ripple in your departments is just sitting with someone and showing them how to make latex you know the <laughs> that word um the math you know kind of thing accessible for screen readers you know like you know that those kind of programs sometimes you hear about it it's like okay good to know but when someone sits down with you and really shows you it's like okay this makes sense i can do this and that one hour of your time can ripple hugely within the community right in terms of all the students who are going to come for those other classes and that's just recognizing that as a, we are responsible for creating a culture of accessibility within our own department within this larger campus and so all of us are playing a role and so just thank you for continuing to be that ripple and a special huge shout out and thank you to anyone who is kind of thinking about their concession policy and the reweighting of midterms to finals because that just causes so much stress for especially students managing anxiety from the date they miss that midterm to as they move forward in the course that final just so much stress so for anyone who's having a second opportunity to write a midterm or an alternative project um, just a huge thank you for the impact that's having on mental health on campus and i would encourage you strongly to think about that as you work through with your departments helping others think about um, sometimes what's easy and what's right you know so thank you so much for the for that work Thank you. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to remind who we are. So I'm Dr. Jacqueline D or J Jackie, as I'm known to most people. And I'm representing myself with the, the magical mushroom from Mario fame. Um, I'm the actual lecturer and lab coordinator for the course that we're working on. And this is? Hi, I'm Gigi. I'm the biology program manager. So that's not Philip. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and we've been working together over this past many months um, to uh, do a number of things, which I will just highlight sort of the major projects that we've been working on. We did some some other things on the side because there were so many um, conversations and inspirational things that kind of came up. We saw other people doing, so we're like, yeah, we got to do that too. Um, but I'll just uh, share with you the, the major things. Um, so just in terms of background, um, this is Biology 209, which is a second year organismal biology course. So this is the, the counterpart to what Carissa and Erica are working on, but in the plant world. Um, and the course is centering on fungi, algae, and bryophytes, which if you're not familiar with are things like moss and the diversity of those organisms. Um, and it's basically a 50% lecture and 50% lab course. So the students have to pass the lab to pass the course. Um, <clears throat> and currently most of the weight um, of the course is on exams. So the assessment is primarily through exams. Um, so the first thing we wanted to do was add 
um, real hands-on field trips and make them really accessible so that all students could come to them. So previously there were these maybe sort of piecemeal, hey, we're gonna go to the forest, hey, we're gonna go to the beach. Now we're making it so that everybody can come hopefully. Um, so we're putting them during class and uh, they're going to be really close by. And we basically spent a couple weeks, Gigi and I driving around town and like scouting out good places that had like wide trails and like really like no elevation gain basically. So places that, that folks, you know, depending on whatever, wherever you are in your fitness or physical ability, hopefully people will be able to join us. Um, however, there are alternatives that we also created. So two of them being uh, virtual tours and one sort of a scavenger hunt style tour on campus in case folks, you know, can't participate for whatever reason um, in those uh, in-person field trips. Um, and this is just an example of one of the tools. Luckily, this was already created. I didn't create this. So some students and my colleague, uh, Bridget Clarkston, had created this uh, amazing immersive website where you can explore a beachfront. Um, and you can like kind of turn it around and, and, um, and you can click on those little circles that you can see. Um, and like little pictures of, of algae and some information about them will pop up. And so we've created sort of a, an activity around that for students to do if they can't make it, for example, to the, the beach field trip. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing that we're excited about is designing tactile models and group modeling activities. So these are here to help students interpret microscopic structures. So a lot of our lab is just sitting down and looking at stuff through the microscope for three hours um, with, you know, your back's like hunched over and it's, it's a long time and it's just looking at a lot of really tiny things. Um, and the other thing is we really want to build personal connections and we want students to have timely feedback. And so I am excited to show you our very first 3D printed model. <laughs> you can decide for yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Take a bow, Gigi. <laughs> you can decide for yourself what that looks like. Um, <laughs> But where, and it was based on, for example, so you know, the very hungry caterpillar. Um, so as you know, you, as you might suspect, the thing of Earth, the places where we get 3D models already made don't exist for things like really obscure moss. <laughs> like, surprise. Um, so we had to make them. So we, we basically based it off the very hungry caterpillar. Um, you can obviously tell. Um, anyway, so that's that. Um, the, the other project that we worked on, oh, so this, sorry, I should say what that is. <laughs> so it's supposed to be a cell of a uh, sphagnum moss. So the kind of peat moss that you put in like planters arrangements to like hold water and increase or decrease pH, like make it more acidic, your soil, help with drainage, water retention, all that stuff is actually this really uh, amazing cell that's hollow at maturity and has these holes in it. So they're like, we're trying to demonstrate really how good it is for holding water. And we thought three dimensions really helps with that as opposed to just seeing what they see in the microscope. Um, another project that we've been working on is adding multiple modes of engagement, action, and expression through the creation of these projects. So one of them is this iNaturalist project. So we're gonna be taking the students out to the field and they're going to be collecting and also taking photographs of um, moss and relatives and friends in the wild. Um, and, and actually putting those photos on this, site, this website, I don't know if people are familiar with it or not, it's called iNaturalist. So basically anyone, anywhere, any place with a phone um, can go and snap pictures of um, wildlife and put it up for scientists to actually use. So this is basically a way for students, you know, who just with their little phone to basically participate in research, um, which is really, I hope, exciting for students. Oh yeah, okay. Um, and there's just the, what the project looks like online. Um, we're also incorporating, again, more ways of students engaging with the, with the material. So we're having a thing called scientific eating, which is basically I bring food that is related to the lab content and we eat it. Um, and, and I even got food handler certification to, to do it safely so that we don't poison anyone. Um, the other thing that I'm excited about is we made the, the lab manual online. So previously it was just a floppy hard copy and now it's got some animations and it's good for the immersive reader. So excited about that. Um, we've got some project evaluation underway. So Natasha has very kindly um, uh, developed some with me, some um, evaluations and reflections and we're excited to learn whether this was helpful to students or not. Thank you. 
Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Stefan. I'm the science education specialist in the computer science department. Firas cannot be here today. He is at a conference. Okay, and uh, we've been working on a uh, on the course CPSC 203, and Firas uh, was the most recent lecturer in this uh, class. And just to orient yourself, uh, it's a general service course, and so it's just for non-majors. It's there's no computer science majors in it, and uh, it's 90% uh, uh, of the students are either BSc, BA, or BCom. And uh, for a lot of students, this is actually the second time they might take a. Uh, uh, programming course uh, at the uh, at UBC and at all. And so um, we are trying to, so there's still novices. And um, uh, this course was created in 2019 by uh, uh, Cinda Heron and um, was already designed with many um, inclusive practices in mind. And I will talk about these a little bit more. So it started in 2019 and right now uh, we have an enrollment of 100 students uh, in a single section. Um, so and our goals were that we wanted to have an open access website that's not limited to Canvas, that's actually publicly available, and create subtitled videos. So Cinda has already done tremendous work of recording videos. And then uh, we wanted to provide scaffolding so students can set up their computers so they're ready to uh, start the course. Uh, we are creating uh, accessible slides and we also uh, making a question bank that will enable mastery learning in the course. Uh, so here, uh, first, I want to talk about the website and the subtitled videos. So having uh, the website and using just HTML makes it also already much more accessible for screen readers, as we heard now many, many times. And one of the other goals was to have the videos and um, um, break them down into smaller chunks before they were often a whole lecture, but we made, uh, Furas made uh, shorter chunks out of them and also create a, 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 a transcription for the uh, uh, videos, uh, but used an automated tool so far. And so we're looking into a, a tool that actually allows students to annotate the videos together to improve the um, uh, quality of the uh, transcription. Um, so that was one of the aspects. And the other aspect is with the videos, we can much more easier have a flipped classroom set up and uh, provide students with other experience in classroom to actually program and work on uh, problems to uh, solve in class. Then one of the challenges that's often uh, underrated is like setting up your own computer to actually be able to program and test uh, different things. Uh, there's many different uh, tools that you need. You need a text editor to write your code. You need the files that we provide and all kind of uh, other suite of uh, things that you need. And uh, in the beginning, that can be quite intimidating and can be an equity issue if you have any issues to set up uh, the uh, system on your computer. So what we, uh, what Firas provided is also a virtual spaces online that students can use. And it's basically this button, they click here, the open workspace, and they can just um, uh, uh, use a, a ready-made programming environment for them where all the files are ready. And that gives us just some buffer to get the students up to speed to install and there's no panic about getting the computer ready because the first five or six weeks, they're just on the virtual environment. And that gives us enough time to explain them how to set up their own computer. And this is just an example. And also one of the other advantages is that we use a very popular text editor. So students are also using things that are very important for, uh, for the future. So they gain this experience that increases their engagement because it's actually tools they will use anywhere across the industry, for example, if they should decide to do something with programming. Uh, then uh, I've been working on accessible slides. So uh, previously the slides have been PowerPoint slides and I transformed them into a different format. So you can also create HTML uh, web pages from them. Like this presentation right now is also an example from that. And we saw that earlier too in one of the other presentations. And again, uh, having HTML in general gives you the general uh, screen uh, reader uh, capabilities, but it also, you can provide uh, additional accessible features like uh, access accessibility features like um, 
uh, alt text for images quite easily. One other thing that's now just uh, uh, happening with uh, uh, the technology of uh, those slides is that now you're also able to actually run code without having a server in the background and you can just uh, right away uh, uh, show code examples and the students themselves would be able to modify the code up here and play around it. They don't have to have any installation. All they need is a running browser and they can use it on any platform or mobile devices. And that also increases the accessibility side of things that it doesn't matter what kind of device they have. Then one very big aspect of this that has been already in the works uh, and uh, uh, undergrad TA is working on uh, Ming Yang uh, uh, is a randomized question bank. And so the advantages uh, uh, of this question bank is that we use a platform called Prairie Learn, which enables you to randomize all kinds of different aspects of a question. So if you here look, it's describing a puzzle in circular shape. Over here, it describes a knitting project. Basically, it's kind of determining the number of uh, pieces in one example for the puzzle or the number of stitches here. And so that gives you a lot of uh, flexibility in asking questions and reusing them. And also students can repeat them, enabling them to use uh, mastery learning. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much. And so if you want to reach out to us, have any questions about the technologies we have used, uh, please, these are the, uh, is the information to contact us. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Carrie Krakowski, and um, I'm really delighted to be part of the UDL Scholars with my incredible team. Uh, we are part from UBC Health, and Michelle, I'll hand it over to you. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Hamilton. I'm the Education Program Manager at UBC Health. Hi, my name is Jenny Lee. I'm the Education Program Assistant, working close with my colleague. So I thought I would just give you a little bit of context here because our um, our unit uh, supports interprofessional learning across 15 health and human service programs at UBC. And so it's very different from supporting one course or one class. Uh, we have some unique considerations, which uh, I'll just, Jenny, come on over here. Um, Jenny's gonna give you the rundown of, of some of those considerations. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the, uh, the other contextual issues. So. Um, so as you can see from the screen, so we uh, delivered the intercurriculum to 15 health programs. And one of the challenges that we have more students at the district sites like Surrey, Prince George, Kelowna, and Victoria. So it's becoming more and more complicated. And this data is based on last year. So we delivered the um, uh, integral curriculum to over 2,000 students. And we have 135 facilitators uh, recruited by the health programs. Um, some of them are faculty uh, facilitator and some are clinical instructors. And we will also have, uh, we have partnership with um, BC Center for Substance Use. So some of the uh, facilitators are uh, recruited by that center and also to deliver the substance use stigma uh, workshop. And one of the uh, features is we have patients facilitators uh, for the collaborative decision making, which is really valuable learning experience for our students. So we got really uh, positive feedback for the student from the students. Um, then we have uh, eight. We deliver eight uh, activities. We have uh, professionalism and team-based care, and we have four cocktails for ethics, uh, and then we have health informatics, uh, collaborative decision-making, uh, indigenous cultural safety. We also have four core health. Some of them are only online modules and some of them we have uh, synchronous uh, workshops. And uh, also, uh, yeah, I think that's basically it. And we did 128 workshops last year. Thanks so much, Jenny. And Jenny is a really big part of our universal design because um, Jenny is like the the air traffic controller of 
the entire operation. And so to give you a little further context, um, when, um, as Laura, and this is a shout out to Neil, Laura, and Janelle, because you, you guys covered some some really important aspects. Um, Neil, you talked about what was uh, what needed to happen outside the classroom. So we have huge considerations around that. How, like, how do people navigate? They're not going to their familiar classroom spaces. They are distributed. They're not going to be with their familiar faces. They're going to be put into interdisciplinary groups with, with strangers. They're not going to know their facilitator. We're working with facilitators from very diverse backgrounds. Some of them are faculty, some of them are community members, some are coming with experience. Um, and so we do not only need to think about UDL for our, our student learners, but we need to think about UDL for our facilitators as well. And so part of the, we're just going to feature a couple of things. We've done a lot because we have to launch this in September, um, but I will just feature a couple of exciting things that we've done this year. So one other thing that I want to just highlight is in the health disciplines, we enculture our learners to be a specific profession, right? But when you're thinking about team-based care, you also have to take on a team-based identity. So they're really, we're just trying to foster two different identities here. So shout out to Laura here about belonging. Um, I'll shout out to Janelle about managing expectations. I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle now to talk about how we started that journey around managing expectations. Okay. So a big part of our project this year was creating an online syllabus style website, which is the IC Navigator. So if you want to take your phones and scan the QR code there, you can have a peek at it. And I'll just highlight a few points um, from the site. But before that, I want to shout out to AC Dagger and thank her for the help that she provided in connecting us with the student facilitators. And we received some really good feedback on the site and tried to implement as much as we could. Um, so from the site, so on the homepage, you can see our accessibility statement. So this is really an invitation for students to communicate with us around accessibility. And our goal is really to have these conversations as early as possible so that we can find the best solutions for them. And also on our site, we have a workshop experience page. As Carrie mentioned, there's a lot of unpredictability with our workshops. So we want to let students know that we want to gave them a description of what the workshop experience is like, and that can hopefully prompt them to talk to us about things that might be concerns, and then we can plan around that ahead of time. Another important part of this website is the self-care and wellness resources that we've created. Uh, we cover a lot of sensitive topics in our workshops, so we wanted to make sure that we can create a safe learning environment by prompting both facilitators and students to have expectations about this and to have self-awareness around their conversations, and then also to provide supports. And we've included our distributed sites in our list of supports on the website. So we've included supports for Prince George, Kelowna, uh, and Victoria as well as well as online supports for students who are very remotely distributed to small locations. And the last thing I wanted to highlight about the IC Navigator site is it's also a resource for programs, for program administrators, for facilitators, for course instructors who are involved with our integrated curriculum so that they're receiving the same information that the students are and we're all on the same page. And for that reason, we moved some of this information outside of Canvas just to make it more accessible to everyone. So I'll pass it back over to Carrie. I see our time is up, but I just wanted to invite you to um, experiment with a chat with Marie Parker, which is one of our ways that we've uh, engaged our students into, uh, into uh, learning with different modalities. And big shout out to John Chang, who's here with us today. Uh, so just you can try that out if you have a chat GPT account. Uh, and thanks again. Uh, we'll, welcome to any questions. So. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Jennifer. This is my colleague, Brian, and uh, we're working in Vantage College, which for context is who we are. So Vantage is a first year program for international students who have the um, uh, academic qualifications for their first year, and they're supporting or I am supporting the language of the discipline specifically now with engineering courses. So how uh, language is used in engineering design and how engineering design 
helps with language and vice versa. So as I said, international students, it is academically competitive. That linguistic scaffolding and linguistically responsive pedagogy is, is my purview. And specifically, as I said, language in engineering design. A little bit nervous here. All right. Um, was this me or you? Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, so one of the first things we wanted to do was just build on everybody's experience from last year and to try to not reinvent things from the start once again. So a couple of things or four things that we've really tried to do going forward, knowing that we can't go back and fix everything in the past, but we can certainly change things going forward is just little things like making sure the documentation uses a consistent style sheet so things can easily be changed. Uh, making sure that all the images have all text, which we all know, but it's much harder than than we we think. And it's to actually do that on every single image uh, is time consuming, but it's, it's something we are aiming for. Uh, making sure that all links have an accessibility and readability component. So updating links so that they're more friendly for screen readers. And then anything we put in Canvas is uh, using a responsive layout so that it works just as well on a phone as it does on a large monitor or a small monitor. Because one of the things we found out last year is a lot of students when they're on their phone weren't seeing information simply because the page wasn't responsive enough and they weren't either scrolling down or scrolling to the side. And so they're like, what are you talking about? I didn't see any of that stuff. And so now everything fits to the screen. So in updating uh, content specifically within the syllabus, I wrote an accessibility statement um, and not just about um, making my course more accessible, but a fundamental principle is requiring accessibility in the students' assignments. Because these are engineering students, they need to be thinking about user design, they need to be, they're engineering to solve problems, and so I want to require access and enhance accessibility in the work that they produce. So I incorporated that into the accessibility statement that I'm aiming to make this as accessible as possible and looking for their query and confirming how that's happening and how it can be improved, but also as a learning objective for the course. I have wider um, admission, um, sorry, assignment submission windows. I have excised the word deadline from all of my from my my corpus, my vernacular entirely. So talking about submission windows and something that we were just talking about last week was that there's sort of an automatic extension with the requirement of an email. That, that there's an engagement piece, just ask in that practice of communication. And this is an engineering thing. Engineers, I'm, I'm married to one, they don't actually get their stuff done on time. There's always that communication, this project is not gonna be delivered on time, this is how I'm gonna rectify the situation. And so enculturating that you know, from, from first year. So as I said, the accessibility not only into my delivery, but also into the assignment criteria. And then some of the assignments I'm working on multiple means of expression and how they can enhance. So their poster presentations, the alt text, um, and uh, just various means that they can enhance the delivery of the, the course content that I'm working in collaboration with their engineering design colleagues. Um, so some of the ways that I'm doing this is making reference to external um, accessibility criteria, so government legislation, engineers and geoscientists of British Columbia, I'm in communication with them. And so it's not just this one little pet project that I have, but this is part of that enculturation for a professional trajectory. And these are requirements of practice to bring them in and enculturate early. Um, and within the course materials using UDL to support the student's design proficiency, so the idea of end user. And then a lot in terms of that effective piece and the relevance of the work is a lot more explicit rationale for the importance of communication and engineering. It's not enough just to be good at physics, no shade on physics, but it's not just to be good enough at the technical skills that communication really is an important part of professional engineering practice. So we just brought in a couple of uh, three examples, actually, of how we're making small changes. Jennifer's making small changes to her her coursework. So as she mentioned, uh, she's re, uh, looking at the, the group, group work requirements. And one of the pieces is including accessibility in how the groups are actually formed. Groups are really important in this course because the groups that are formed in, in the VAT 140 course also 
are used in the uh, applied science uh, 150 course. And so they have group roles. And so they have to consider things like what happens if somebody can't show up and actually participate in a program for or a presentation when uh, when required. And what roles are the group members going to, to take on? So these are negotiated uh, at the beginning. The next one is a typical kind of example of an image that an engineer might come across. So in this one is a hydrostatic pressure um, in a dam. And so students have to decide whether the alt text is functional or whether the image is functional or uh, decorative. If it's decorative, it has to be marked. If it's functional, then they have to figure out how the alt text has to work with how they describe it as an engineer, in this case, perhaps mathematically. And the last one is an alternative task type. So this is looking at uh, core definitions within engineering and engineering practice. And so how students will then uh, work on how these terms are used within engineering, but it's now gonna be added so that uh, imagery is also used to illustrate some of these key ideas. Not alt text for the imagery. Yes, of course. Um, next steps, and our time is almost up, so we'll just put this up. So to make this not only accessible but sustainable, um, this the, what we've talked about is our plans for first for this first reiteration. But going forward, I think something that I'd like to do is have the students go out and see campus a little bit more and compile examples of accessibility implementation on campus. What is being done? What else could be done? Again, that engineering perspective. And then what I would really like to do is to work more with my engineering colleagues who have been very supportive and on board, but having them require some of the same UDL and accessibility principles, not only in my course, but in their courses as well. So that's my blue sky thinking about it. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer and Brian. I uh, just one other thing that we're that we're adding on. We've put up our presentation, but I've also done a little extra little bit on linguistically responsive instruction. I said way back when here that if people thought about language as a means of accessibility, I would um, die a happy person. That's a bit soon. But nonetheless, there's a there's an extra little supplement up there about making language more accessible in the academy. And so I invite you to check that out. We'll get that up sometime very, very soon. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm here to talk about um, our course that we're looking at. Our course is, if there's one side of the Venn diagram, it's called BA562. Uh, it's titled Creativity, and it's a re create. <laughs> Sorry, my brain is right saying. Uh, it's titled Creativity. It's a required course for many of the master's programs at, at Sauter. Um, and then we're also looking at the concept of uh, ADHD. And so in that, just a quick example, ADHD has been described as having a brain that moves with the force of a Ferrari and the brakes of a bicycle. Right. And if you look at you know, I'll just give you a little window into my brain, right? If you, if you hold your fist up in front of your hand, and this is the brain, and we see the brain stem, uh, a lot of traditional classroom settings that require a lot of sitting, a lot of slides, a lot of technology, create like a lot of stress in our brain because our brains are moving, moving so quickly, uh, we can't break. And so what we're especially looking at in this course that I teach is we're looking at the intervention of movement, right? So how movement can be, at, it can be more thoughtfully incorporated into this course um, for all students, but with a particular lens on students and instructors with ADD. So um, I'm the teacher and the faculty member who, who runs this course, but I am working alongside an incredible team of educators, uh, Erica, Siobhan, Suna, and also an incredible undergraduate research assistant named Kieran, who's uh, really in this work with us, but couldn't come today. So wanted to share a few thoughts here around what we're doing so far. So the changes we've made to the upcoming course fall along the different uh, principles. So one is, you know, the multiple means of engagement 
we're looking at adjusting the activity timing of certain things that I already do in the course. I already incorporate a lot of movement in the course, probably too much. And so we're tweaking the duration and scheduling of the activities to better you know, fit within a class period and not have us running at a time. We're also looking at multiple means of representation um, with enhanced instructions, more detailed instructions and examples to help students understand the purpose and expected outcomes of the activity. You know, if about between five and 10% of folks identify as having ADD and as the instructor, if I'm really teaching from that 5%, like I'm really drawing on my team to help me think about the articulation of instructions for the other 95%. Um, multiple means of action. We're looking at things like flexibility and the execution of the activities, um, how students engage with the movement activities, ensuring that they can participate comfortably and meaningfully, which I already do, but we may want to broaden the scope of that. Um, and then multiple means of representation uh, is an engagement in Sorry, multiple means of representation. Another one is to um, really look at the Canvas course as a complementary space. I think of the T.S. Eliot poet, uh, poem that says we had the experience, but we missed the meaning. So my, my classes tend to be very experiential, but sometimes students walk and go and say, what was that? <laughs> and so if they're just going to kind of a pretty linear, pure set of text in Canvas, very similar to Paul and Leon's work, like what's another way to think about Canvas as a translation tool? So some of the things we've learned so far is that uh, movement can settle the brain. It can, it can enhance student engagement and concentration, in particular for uh, neurodiverse learners with ADD. Activities involving physical movement can uh, increase focus, participation, and also sense of belonging and meaning making. Um, these can also be felt by the educators. We also have been looking into various research fields informing the subject. So our undergraduate research assistant, she's completing a business and sociology degree, but she's also a professional dancer. And she's looking at the sociology of education, but also looking into research, research and movement studies, um, which really complements the foundation of the work beyond uh, UDL and, and our extensive knowledge in educational research. Um, we're looking at different types of movement for the activities that I typically do. So if I was going to do one exercise with movement, we're looking at different ways that there can be a menu of options. And um, practical considerations, you really need clear communication, but also some of the roadblocks are um, room bookings, noise, <laughs> scheduling, um, space constraints. We are completely over over registered in the Henry Angus building, it is almost impossible for me to get rooms where I'm not constantly bumping into things and have stuff everywhere. Uh, those rooms are very rare in, on this campus. Um, but we'll continue to do what we've always done. We're going to provide options for physical movement in the course um, and also start to think about how we can share these ideas with faculty who, who are curious but have different um, structures and brains than me. Uh, yeah, so the big questions that linger, um, how will we measure the long-term impact of these activities, and how can we scale these practices to other courses or settings? Um, hello, everyone. Um, sorry I couldn't be there to join you in person today. Um, I'm guessing I'm a giant floating head on the screen. Um, but yes, thank you, Afsana, and thank you all for sharing your projects. Um, it was really great to hear about all the cool stuff everyone is, is doing. Um, so thank you for letting me join remotely. Um, I will just quickly um, draw your attention to the evaluation side of things. Um, so both in terms of the program level evaluation that we are doing of the UDL Fellows Program, um, and then also project level evaluation. So just starting out, talking about the post-program eval. Um, many of you, most of you um, filled out the pre-program survey and thank you so much for doing that. Um, now that we've kind of wrapped up the formal program piece of the UDL Fellows Program, we also have a post-program survey. Um, 
you can complete the post-program survey with the link that's in the slides um, that I'm guessing will be sent out after the session. Um, and the right-hand side of this slide also includes a QR code if that is an easier option for you to fill out um, the survey. I just wanted to let you know that um, the evaluation surveys really do help us make real change. Um, so for example, the structure of this session, um, the kickoff session, um, various pieces of how we ran the program this year were actually a result um, of requests that were made on the um, various surveys last year um, with last year's cohort to, to have more chances to build connection um, and to kind of cohort build um, with their peers in the program. Um, so please do take some time to fill that out. It should take you about seven to 10 minutes. Um, and please give us your honest feedback. We'd love to know what worked really well for you. We'd love to know what didn't work for you. Um, any ideas you have for changes or improvements, um, resources that you found helpful. We've got a number of questions um, for you. Um, so yes, please do take some time to fill that out in the next few weeks. Um, we'll leave it open probably for about three weeks. Um, and I'll send out a reminder as well. Um, and then I also just wanted to take a minute to chat about um, project level evaluation. So I've been working with a few folks um, on their project. Um, and, and I would just highly encourage you if you would like to reach out, um, I can help you with kind of any piece of the evaluation at the project level. So whether that just looks like a consultation, um, I can help you with things like survey design, um, being the person who comes into your classroom to recruit students as someone who's completely separate from the course. I can help with data analysis, um, really kind of any stage of the evaluation process. Um, and I can also help share resources. So we have things like, you know, sample consent forms, templates for things, um, happy to help out however um, is best suited for your project. So please do feel free to reach out. My email address also is um, available on this slide and, and will be part of um, the email sent out. Um, so please feel free to set up a consultation with me at any point in time. Always happy to chat. Um, I'll just read this slide in case um, in case anyone's unable to read it. So um, it's a quote um, from a fellow from last year's cohort. Um, the quote says, I'm seeing large increases in engagement in my students this year, I believe due to the many changes that I've made. Increasing student autonomy and reducing the need for concession has been a significant improvement and reduced my workload as I no longer receive numerous emails over the term from students concerned about missing one small quiz. Um, and I just really love this quote um, because I think it captures a lot of the themes of what folks mentioned in this year's pre-program survey, things like increasing accessibility, supporting learning, motivation, um, supporting student well-being. Um, so I just also wanted to flag that um, at the end of the term in which you implement your project into your classroom, um, we will also be reaching out um, just to get some more kind of stories to just hear about um, how the implementation process went for you um, to, to kind of get a sense of, of what worked and what didn't, and also just to hear about um, all of the great things that are going on. So I just wanted to flag that um, as, as the next checkpoint um, where I will be emailing you and reaching out. Um, and please, again, feel free to reach out at any point in time to chat more about um, how I can help with that process. Um, so thank you. And if there's any questions, please feel free to um, let me know or, or throw them in the chat, Jeff, or if you want to speak into the microphone, if anyone has one, I'm happy to answer questions. Now we are going for our last section of today's session, our closing remarks and next step. I'll pass it on to Jeff Miller, Senior Associate Director with Center for Teaching Learning Technology. See if you have an echo with me. Oh, no echo. What One of me is enough. Uh, this has been a wonderful morning. I just want to thank each and every one of you for uh, presenting today, showing so much enthusiasm and commitment. And, you know, just looking at what you've been working on over the summer, there's been so much interesting kind of creative engagement with your projects. And I love the, the fact that you're, you're kind of exploring different avenues of this in terms of what matters in terms of your teaching, your context, the group that you work with in terms of your courses or within your units. You know, this is, has really been quite a, a wonderful kind of, it's been very gratifying to see this. And um, I think I'm in getting infected by some of your excitement about the work that you're doing. And, and I look forward to hearing more as you get into implementation. Um, I just wanna say a few brief things and, and you know, it's evident already with some of the things that you've reported in some of your, your presentations. Um, we're already feeling the impact 
of the UDL program. And, you know, you're the second cohort going through. You have yet to kind of do the great things in your classrooms that you've been talking about today for the most part, but we're already seeing that there are networks forming. We're hearing conversations happening within programs, within units, within departments. Um, there have been department-based workshops. There's been sharing at retreats over the summer. There's just been a lot of kind of cross-connection within departments and across departments. And um, that's really important important and that's something that we want to feed and actually you're going to have to help us with that because it's really the connections of the networks that you're creating that will sustain and grow this activity. Um, we do anticipate that the university will continue to invest time, energy, and give priority to ensuring that we are more inclusive as an institution. That means we have to address accessibility barriers to access for everyone. That includes faculty, staff, and students. That includes our facilities. That includes how we teach. And I, I'm, I'm still kind of tingling from uh, Elisa's opening remarks and just kind of thinking about it, how much it matters that students are heard, they're given an opportunity to to be themselves and to be encouraged to be successful through their interaction and engagement with university. Um, so I would ask you to continue to seek out opportunities. I mentioned here on the slide, you know, think of putting a TLEF project in. We, we see projects like that coming forward now in the last few years. years. Um, CTLT offers institutes, uh, celebrate learning, your own department offers symposia and other kinds of events. Think about how you can be a bearer of the conversation within your department with your colleagues. And, and again, I was really pleased to hear how some of you are already doing that. We're already engaging locally. Um, we will continue to build capacity and networks. And so, as Natasha mentioned, we'll be reaching out to you and connecting with you on some aspects as you move towards implementation in the work. We are still going to be uh, collecting stories and other things too. So we are, are, are generating materials and some interviews right now that will go up on the UDL Hub website, but we'll continue to build resources out and look for opportunities to continue to, to um, engage this topic. We're not yet confirmed about whether we can do a third cohort of the UDL program, but I'm hopeful we'll be able to do something like that. So stay tuned for that. Um, the other thing I just want to mention, um, you know, there's been a couple uh, projects today. I've talked about even using some of the emerging technologies like generative AI in relation to lowering barriers um, and making things more accessible. So we saw one example of that. Um, um, Afsana and Lucas uh, Wright uh, from CTLT, they bang together this cool little thing called UDL PAL. You can find a link to it on the UDL Hub website. And, you know, we, we're seeing all kinds of people building tools, building pathways, building strategies to make things more accessible. So I think that that also will be something that we see in the next little while, experimentation. Oops. Okay. Um, so again, thank you, thank you to everyone. Um, I want to, um, you know, really thank the fellows, uh, for the, the faculty and the staff, all of you and all of the connected folks within your departments who have made this opportunity, giving you space and time and resources to this. Um, I, I think that you will be really important leaders in terms of how this continues to grow. Um, I also want to thank uh, the UDL fellow uh, planning team. And there, you can see a whole bunch of names here. And I really want to emphasize, look at all of the different faculties involved. Look at all of the different units involved. This program has to grow across the whole of the university. It can't live in any one unit. It's far too important. It takes all of us, as Elisa said earlier, to support this. And I'm wondering if I could just get anyone who is on the UDL planning team this year or last year, could you please stand up just so people can see who you are? I'm already standing, so I'm in here. So just a round of applause. This has taken, this has taken a fair bit of effort to, to, uh, to run in the last couple of years, and we're not done. We will still be here for you for the remainder of this year. Um, I also want to mention that we have a, a bunch of students who have been involved. Uh, we have students that were uh, referenced by our colleagues at CFA who have been offering student facilitation and they've been offering advice both to some of the projects as well as to the UDL planning team. Uh, we have uh, Paulina who has been helping us with timekeeping today. 
um, uh, as well as developing stories uh, on the on the UDL Hub site that will start to appear. Um, and I don't know all of the names, but we have also had a whole bunch of students working on some of the project teams. Like, how wonderful is that, that some of the, the teams brought students and student voices into the conversation as they go? So finally, this project is funded by the T Teaching Learning Enhancement Fund, and we gratefully acknowledge the financial support provided by UBC Vancouver students to make all of this possible to support your efforts and your creativity. So thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the day. Please eat some more because we have a lot of food left over. <laughs> all right. Take care.